And yeah, maybe if also yeah, like if you have like co-authors, then it actually makes sense. It's like the inputs and the outputs, you connect them like tensor diagrams. <laughs> it's like no, so I, you know, if if I had, I should have like written uh, Pavish Kotari and then yeah, like, uh, because uh, I guess the whole thing amounts from some inner product of everything. Yes. So, uh, yes. And um, I think actually to, um, um, we might even uh, finish before time. So there is time for to ask questions. Uh, don't uh, don't hesitate to stop me if there is more time. There is uh, I might talk about some related resu uh, result that uses the same techniques and uh, in uh, or similar techniques in a very different setting. But I very be ha very happy to also skip that and talk uh, more and answer questions. So don't hesitate to stop me. So um, okay, so we start with this notion. Okay, we are going to talk about entanglement. I don't have to tell you; you know much better than me that entanglement is somewhat of an elusive or difficult quantity. And how is it uh, manifested? Uh, I guess one way, one one version of it, we don't really have a nice, clean formula like mutual information, uh, classical mutual information, or something like that. That kind of captures uh, an entanglement or like a simple simple formula. We have 11 formulas, but and uh, but uh, maybe not one uh, simple that captures uh, the entanglement of, a, say, a state over, say, uh, two systems over uh, each of them, uh, say, of these states. Um, we similarly, we don't have a simple formula to capture if you're given a measurement, um, what uh, which which of its eigenstates um, are um, only separable? Which of them um, uh, which of them have separable uh, uh, are separable? Which of them are entangled? And basically, the uh, basically the best known algorithms um, uh, to uh, if you're given a state a mixed state and you want to decide if it's entangled or not, or, uh, if you're given a measurement and you want to know if it's an entanglement witness or not, basically take time exponential, basically brute force. And this talk will be about a better than a uh, brute force algorithm for one version of the second problem. And th the second problem is this, um, is this problem of uh, uh, f f figuring out if a measurement is an entanglement witness. And <laughs> Just so uh, this is like a theoretician type of better than boot focus. It's uh, you know uh, will be two to the square root d, and uh, I didn't compl uh, try to work it out. In some sense, it's not the algorithm; it's the analysis. The algorithm is the DPS algorithm that everyone knows. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sure that our analysis, uh, like Miguel was talking about, hundred particles. I'm sure that uh, our analysis, if you work it out through it, will show you that in you can run this algorithm on a computer, uh, on a system of like uh, three quarters of a particle. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, theoretically better than brute force, uh, and not necessarily practical. So uh, okay, so we are going to uh, consider a system on two qubits. Like think of d as large. So it's basically a system, uh, you know, two systems, uh, uh, each of uh, d possible states. And now the set of uh, make sure we are all on the same place with notation. And again, stop me and ask me if anything is unclear. I um, this is not my home turf, so I might be making mistakes. Uh, so the set of all mixed states is, uh, you know, all PSD matrices of trace one. So it's some convex set, not a circle, but just drawing it like that. And the set of separable state is a subset of it, which is all uh, the mixed states that are a convex combination of uh, states that are like, uh, so they are convex combination of uh, these uh, product tensor product states, U V V. Uh, so so it's some subset of this um, of of the state uh, the set of all states also convex, and uh, another way to say it is that uh, rho is a convex combination of uh, a a dagger for one one matrices a of say uh, unit for Binius norm. Okay, so uh, this is the set of all mixed states. This is the set, uh, and, the, the, and the red set is the set of all um, uh, separable states and entangled states are those that in uh, all and not in set. Everyone with me so far? Okay. 
So, yes. So some matrix, a uh, D by D matrix, right? So uh, another way to say the set, the, the, the set row, this is a, a, uh, it's a system, or it's basically a system that's composed of two systems. So uh, a pure state here is dimension D squared. A uh, mixed state is a matrix that is D squared by D squared. And basically, um, if it's a separable state, then it's a convex combination of things that are of the form A, 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 a dagger, where this is not matrix product. This is like you vectorize the matrix, and uh, maybe I should have written it this way. Like you vectorize the matrix, and you vectorize it, uh, and, and this is you vectorize it and take the transpose. So it has, because it's rank one, right? If it's a rank one matrix, it's basically, uh, right, so, so A is rank one if and only if, basically, A is of the form uh, UV, right? Yeah, maybe I should have written here as yes, tensor. If I wasn't afraid that PowerPoint would crash, I would try to use the pen and add it. <laughs> so uh, yes, A tensor, A, A dagger, yes. Okay, so so this is the set of all separable states. This is the set uh, of all states periods. So all states. Uh, so so that's one way uh, to think about it. And when we are looking at, say, for example, an entanglement measure, we want to quantify if a, a given uh, state uh, row is in SEP, and if not, uh, how far it is from SEP. And and generally, the kind of problems uh, one might ask is one, for one is the quantum separability problem. So you're given some row, uh, say this point ab above here, um, that is a general state, and you want to know how far is it uh, from the uh, from the set of all uh, separable states. So that's one one ver version. And a special case of that would be say to distinguish between zero versus epsilon to distinguish between the case that it is actually separable in the case that it is epsilon far from every separable state. And the other question is this, the best separable qu uh, state question, which is the one we'll mostly focus on, is you're given kind of a direction, you're given a measurement, and the way I'll think about the measurements, I'll normalize it so it's between zero and i, and you want to uh, compute the probability that uh, the, the separable state that maximizes the probability that this measurement accepts. Uh, so you want to compute the maximum of a uh, row star in, in SEP, the of trace m row star. And again, like again the special case uh, could be uh, 1 versus 1 minus epsilon. With 1, then it, that means that there is a separable state where this uh, measurement accepts probability 1. With 1 minus epsilon, it means that every separable state is accepted with probability at most 1 minus epsilon. So for example, if you have a state that is accepted with higher probability than that, then this certifies, this is a witness that it is entangled. Okay, and the, in, uh, and the, the computational problem here, the input is m, and you, the goal is to you know, decide between zero and between uh, the case that it accepts some set, uh, uh, separable states with probability one, and the case that no separable state is accepted with probability better than one minus epsilon. So this is the problem we are going to be interested in. Okay, so uh, the COM is basically uh, best, uh, better than brute force algorithm for this problem. So again, the uh, input is this measurement. We can think of it, it takes, two st uh, it takes a row that has like two parts and it outputs either zero or one. And uh, our goal is to distinguish between these two cases, the case that it accepts a set of probable state and the case that it uh, accepts with probability at most one minus epsilon. And another way to say it is we want to certify, for example, if our algorithm basically uh, algorithm uh, tells us that we are in this case, then we kind of know that we are, uh, it certifies that uh, M is an entanglement witness. And uh, uh, separable, uh, separable states, we said like they are generated by rank one pure states. So another way to think about it is, uh, you know, because m is between 0 and i, we can just ign ignore m and just think of the top eigenspace of that. The eigenspace of, uh, of uh, the uh, vectors that uh, it accepts with probability 1. The uh, so this is an eigenspace, a linear subspace of d squared. And um, our goal is to basically understand 
if there is an intersection between the manifold of rank one matrices and the subspace W, an arbitrary given subspace W. So from this point on, this is the qu pro problem that I'm going to worry about. I'm giving a subspace W, and I want to know if, uh, if it uh, intersects uh, the manifold of rank one matrices or it is epsilon far from it. And note that this is, because we kind of moved to this square dimension rather than d to the four dimension, now this is not a convex set. Like the rank one matrices are not convex. In fact, they're almost, you could think, the farthest away from convex. You could think if you take the average of two rank one matrices, generally you'll get a rank two matrix. You're not going to get a rank one matrix. So, uh, so this is what makes this problem hard in some sense. Okay, so this is uh, this is our problem, and one way, another way to think about it is the input is a, a linear subspace, and suppose someone promised you that there is a rank one matrix that's fully contained in it. Your goal is to find one that is epsilon close to it, and then then that would kind of help you distinguish between the case that it's it contains and the case that say uh, everyone is at least two epsilon far. And and yeah, the trivial algorithm runs into to the D. Uh, it is uh, known to be NP-hard if epsilon is su sub-constant. If it's constant, it known to, uh, it's known to require a quasi-polynomial time. And if the uh, measurement, uh, uh, Fernando uh, showed that uh, if the measurement uh, is of special form, uh, this uh, uh, one-way local uh, operation classical uh, communication, then um, you can do this in quasi-polynomial time. And uh, our result is 2 to the square root d for general measurement. And, um, and basically, we just analyzed the DPS algorithm. So uh, it's not a new algorithm, it's just new analysis. Okay. So the measurement is between zero and i, and epsilon, uh, so think of it as a constant. Generally, it will be, I think, something like square root d divided, I don't know, by epsilon squared, or something like that, and think of, you know, the measurement is scaled to be between zero and i. Okay, so now let me talk about uh, sum of squares. I always like to say that, uh, yeah, if in my talks I try to use it all sorts of PowerPoint tweaks, so at least if you get nothing of the science or the you think the science is boring, at least you learn something about PowerPoint. So uh, you've seen <laughs> the sum of squares, uh, uh, but maybe I'll use different notation, and I think probably I'll use a different viewpoint on it, so I'll somewhat repeat it. Uh, uh, so the way I view the design of sum of squares par uh, algorithm is using the following paradigm, which is uh, not original for me, but I think was observed by Karl Marx and uh, Engels uh, uh, many years ago, that uh, you know, it is better to be rich than to be poor. <laughs> and what does, it, what does it mean in this context? Uh, so uh, it's easier to solve problems if you have extra uh, power. And the way we are going to use it is the following. We first try to solve our problem with an unreasonable algorithm that has extra power that really uh, we, we don't have in practice. And then we look at this sum of squares algorithm that is actually an SDP that is at least in, pr in principle can be uh, executed. And the idea is that if we somehow show that the unreasonable algorithm succeeds on our problem, and we show that by a simple analysis, then this analysis carries over and shows that even the reasonable algorithm, the, the feasible one, also succeeds. So, we, so this is kind of the, uh, our meta meta approach of uh, analyzing sum of squares. And, and what is this hypothetical algorithm? There are basically two versions of this uh, way we use this. One version is that the algorithm has unbounded running time. Uh, and this is in machine learning. Uh, has been used, uh, we have, uh, us and others have used it a lot. And the other one I is what we'll do here is where basically the algorithm is unreasonable because someone gives it hints about the solutions and hints that generally you're not supposed to get. And, uh, and then we show that uh, we can kind of lift this poof uh, and show uh, that uh, you know, the reasonable algorithm that if this uh, super science fiction gun could have 
hit the target, then we could also do it with the you know, simple sum of squares arrow. And right now, this might not make a lot of sense, but let's maybe see, see it uh, more. So, okay, so sum of squares, you can view it as a, an uh, SDP, uh, but you can also view it as a proof system. So if, if you think of it as a proof system, it's a proof system where you're trying to prove that uh, if you have a, you know, a bunch of polynomial inequalities, they imply an another inequality. And, uh, and these PIs are polynomials in invariant polynomials over the reals. And the axioms you have is that you know, P squared for every P is always no negative. And that if, two, if you've already derived that for every X that satisfies your inequalities, P is no negative and Q is no negative, then you know that P plus Q and P times Q is also no negative. And the positive Stenel sets, the, this is a uh, uh, you know, canonical result in real uh, algebraic geometry, is that this proof system is complete. Any true statement can be proven in this proof system. And this is, uh, you know, you've probably seen that uh, in Lasser's talk. And uh, the degree of the proof, we can count the degree, is the maximum syntactic degree in the derivation. What I mean by syntactic degree is that I mean, um, is if this has degree d and this has degree d prime, I always consider this to have degree uh, d plus d prime and this the maximum of d and d prime. I don't, I don't look at uh, cancellations. I kind of keep track of the degree uh, syntactically. And, uh, and, uh, and then this theorem by Lasser and Parillo, and uh, there's also a version of it for, uh, by now show, is that you can run an SDP to solve this problem in uh, n, to the d, uh, n to the d time. And you know, example of something you can prove, and probably you've also all seen it. So uh, um, I'll not maybe go over it. Uh, <laughs> the proof, but Cauchy-Schwarz um, is um, you know the proof of Cauchy-Schwarz is a sum of squares argument of degree um, you know the polynomial degree t twice the polynomials involved, and you can show that many other uh, interesting statements actually have uh, sum of squares proofs. Uh, that are um, um, some squares proofs that have low degree, and uh, but they're also like lower bounds. There are some things that require large degree, and one thing that maybe is important to emphasize is that simplicity for some of squares is not the same as simplicity for humans. Uh, so low degree does not mean simple like we think of it in humans. For example, you know some of these lower bounds, these require linear degree, they, they could be, you know, an argument of five lines, but basically just used the probabilistic method. It uses, a, you know, chain of bound and a union bound, and these type of arguments often are very hard to embed in low degree. So th there can be very simple proofs for humans uh, that use the probabilistic method that are hard for sum of squares, and uh, vice versa, uh, some of these results are like basically a uh, an annals of math paper that uh, the, uh, the, the, the proof turns out to be embeddable in low degree sum of squares. So again, it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, okay, but luckily often we are like for the things we care about, at least sometimes we get, we get basically, uh, uh, we can show that it's low degree sum of squares. So basically, this is the degree uh, L sum of squares proof system, which turns out to be quite powerful. And the degree uh, sum of squares algorithm, the way I'm going to view it is the following. I, I'll view it as get as input some polynomials on, say, d variables. And the output is going, the way I I'll view the output is this uh, moment matrix of uh, Lasser. But the way I'll view this output is I'll say these are kind of fake moments which look like moments of a distribution that, uh, over, uh, that is, supported on over, uh, is supported only over points that satisfy the constraints. And the, it is not really moments of a distribution, but you cannot prove that there it's not uh, using a low degree sum of squares proof. So these are fake, but, uh, you know, uh, but but it's hard to tell. For example, I mean, I think these are actually, you know, as f I'm not very uh, sensitive, so probably this could be fake Nike issues, uh, but I would not be able to tell apart the difference. So, uh, si so similarly, these are like, um, these moments are uh, not real, but sometimes, uh, uh, it's hard to distinguish. So let me show an example from uh, some of squares and, you know, quantum information, because 
this is the and again this is an example you've all seen, but maybe in different language, maybe in this language, I'm not sure. So Bell's inequality. So Bell's inequality, one way to say it is the following. Suppose you have the following game, uh, Alice gets A, uh, Bob gets B, and, uh, and then they output, uh, they, uh, they each output a, uh, something plus minus one, and the game is that they get one dollar if, uh, they get one dollar if the outputs agree, unless A equals B and, uh, and uh, A equals uh, A and B are both one, and then they pay one dollar if their inputs agree and get one dollar if the inputs disagree. So another way to say it is that basically their reward is, you know, their, uh, Alice's in, uh, output only depends on A, Bob's output only depends on, on B, and their reward is basically a x0, y0, plus x1, 0, y1, plus x1, y0, but minus x1, y1. And the theorem is basically, if you scale it to this thing, this, the Bell's theorem is that uh, this is at most 2. And how do you prove it? So here is one way to prove it. You can write, you know, write this reward, take the x0 out and the x1, and then use cauchy schwarz So you use cauchy schwarz you write, you know, the x0 squared plus, uh, and then basically, uh, since uh, uh, these are plus minus one numbers, so x0 squared plus x1 squared is uh, uh, is two, and you know, y0 squared and y1, you open up this thing, so some parts cancel, so you get y0 squared plus y1 squared, each one of them is one. So you basically, uh, you get square root of eight, which is 2.823. But then the other thing you know is that the reward is always an integer. They either get a dollar or they do pay a dollar. So you can, uh, you can take the flow of that and you get two. And this is the, 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 this is the proof that classically they get at most two. But if you look at this proof, then uh, it also <laughs> tells you what's the quantum value. It also bounds the quantum value of this game, which is square root eight. So uh, the difference between the quantum and uh, this difference between the quantum value and the and the classical value is this uh, low bound. And if you notice, uh, the quantum value is bounded using this Cauchy-Schwarz, which is a sum of squares proof. So sum of squares can prove the quantum bound and not the classical bound. Here, and in some sense, you can say that you know nature doesn't maybe follow Einstein, but it does respect Cauchy-Schwarz. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so this is some you know relation how y you can use uh, say again like the difference between a, a proof that is embeddable in sum of squares might be the like difference between uh, quantum and classical and also shows that the fact that a proof is embeddable in sum of squares sometimes means it apl it applies more widely. Okay, so now how do we use the uh, sum of squares algorithm? So the idea is the recipe, the way I view it, is the, the following. is like basically... <laughs> so if you have seen the movie Inception, then uh, basically, uh, you, know, um, like, uh, you know, we use this as our guideline to develop algorithms, which is, of course, a very sound strategy, uh, especially if you already have tenure. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so the idea is the following. You dream that someone gave you access to moments of the solution, and then um, you use these moments to, uh, to obtain uh, the answer. Now, basically, you, it's like these, uh, these movies. You, you got an object in your dream. You hold to it really, really strongly, and you wake up, and you, uh, you really hope that you're still holding it in your hands. And at least in Inception, it works. So, um, so maybe it works here also. So you kind of you you get a solution to the problem in your dream, and then you wake up and you hope you still you still have the solution. And and uh, in some, and another way to say that is maybe less uh, uh, exotic is that you you use fake moments that you generate by the SOS algorithm. You use that to uh, you pretend these are real moments. You analyze the algorithm and show that uh, if there were real moments, you actually got a solution. And now, uh, if your analysis, you go and stare at it and you see the only thing you use is Cauchy Schwarz, Helder, and these kind of things, then um, then uh, basically, uh, even if it was fake moments, you still got the 
even if your dream was wrong and these are fake moments and not real moments, you still have the solution. Okay, so now let's see it concretely with math. So, okay, so the input uh, is a, subsp a subspace uh, in this square dimensional. The assumption, is we, we assume that there is a rank one matrix. And what does it mean to moments of solution? We are now making an extra assumption that someone gave us the moments of some distribution, arbitrary distribution, over uh, the intersection of this manifold rank 1 and W. So I'm assuming that someone gave me this uh, distribution, and it's an arbitrary distribution. Of course, if this distribution was uh, concentrated on a single point, I could read off uh, I could read off the, the, the um, you know the value from this single point, but that's not promised to me. I'm just promised that I get the moments of some distribution. So basically, I'm getting d to the l statistics, uh, you know, uh, or from the monomials. I, I need d to the l numbers uh, to be able to uh, know basically the expectation of you know a polynomial applied to u and v for every uh, degree a polynomial of degree at most l. Okay, so some uh, kind uh, person gave me the, uh, these statistics, and now I want to use that to find a matrix that's close to W. So the first attempt would be the following. I get the statistics. I can take the average over all of these things. At least it's kind of a reasonable thing to do. Um, why not? And, uh, you know, because you can compute the average. Every point of it is just, you know, degree two moments, uh, expectation of UIVJ. And it's a distribution. Uh, we assume this is a distribution supported or, uh, only over rank one matrices that I in this subspace. You take the average, subspace is linear. It's still in this subspace, so that's very nice. So I get a matrix in this subspace. Uh, but the problem is that it's not right, uh, might not be rank one. In fact, it's probably not rank one. So, uh, so this is not so nice. And, and the problem is exactly this set is not convex. So I'm kind of back at square one. But uh, what may, may we can do is, in some sense, we can show that you can reweigh the distribution and you can convexify the set of rank one matrices. So this is basically the main technical theorem of that work. Uh, it shows that for every distribution over rank one d, d, uh, by d matrices, you can uh, find a polynomial of degree square root d, such that if you reweigh uh, the distribution by p of a, then you get this, uh, the average is almost rank one in Frobenius norm, which means that uh, basically up to scaling, it's you know uh, a minus so there is some rank one matrix that up to scaling this is at most some epsilon uh, um, epsilon uh, times the Frobenius norm. So basically, the idea is you take this highly non-convex set and you reweigh it by some polyno polynomial that's the degree square root d, and the, this degree is exactly the price we're going to pay in our running time. And you obtain something that's nearly convex. So the average is close to being, uh, uh, the average is, kind of is close to, um, to being uh, also rank one uh, in Frobenius norm. D d for this particular theorem, this is tight. Yes. So you could ask, you know, this is a little bit crazy. Why should that be true? And where does square root d come from? And, and the inspiration for that, and we'll still now, now see intuition where, where, why, where this comes from. But the inspiration for that is a theorem of Lovett in communication complexity. Uh, the square, uh, you can call it the square root rank theorem. So there is a log rank conjecture that relates, uh, relates the communication complexity and the rank of a matrix um, uh, in logarithmic terms, and uh, Lovett managed to prove something much weaker, but still it's the best known with square root instead of log, and that's our inspiration. And generally, uh, the square root d comes from, you can show that basically if you use the p shatter norm instead of the Frobenius norm, the degree will be uh, d to the 1 over p. So uh, basically, uh, the Frobenius norm is basically the 2 shatter norm, so uh, we get square root d. Yeah, because if you think about a uh, state, right, so, so we, um, we have a particular, uh, we think of a measurement, think of it as just uh, one W, okay? 
So now, um, if we look at a kind of a a, a transpose a dagger a m a. Sorry for forgetting about the cats. Uh, so if if you if this is that this is the probability you accept uh, this state, right? So this is just the uh, Frobenius norm squared of the projection to W of A, right? So 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 the probability. So basically, if you want to say that every one quant thing succeeds with, with probability at most one minus epsilon, you want to say that uh, it finding a one quant that uh, passes the measurement with probability one minus epsilon corresponds to finding. Uh, Finding a, a, a rank one matrix that uh, with Frobenius norm distance for uh, from the subspaces at most epsilon, and this is also equivalent to find uh, right uh, yes exactly so uh, yes so another way to say it almost rank one is that if you take the uh, eight first eigenvalue and you square it, it's larger than the sum of the squares of all the other eigenva eigenvalues. So when you order them, you know, first one is the largest one. Yes. So this is basically the same thing, right? Because what is the best? Okay, uh, so, uh, maybe I should square it. It doesn't, I mean, I don't really distinguish between epsilon and epsilon squared. So uh, what is the best, you know, if you wanted to get like the best approximation of your matrix in Frobenius norm, it will be its top eigenvector. No, no, I, I, okay, we, this is a distribution. Any, this is a theorem that's, to, uh, to, uh, that's uh, for every distribution. Now the assumption we made is that our distribution is supported only over matrices in W. Right, but uh, it's a linear subspace. Right. Right, right. But it will be close to something that is in W, right? So you basically you'll get uh, this is W. A bar is in W. And this leading thing, uh, UV, is not in W, but it's the most epsilon. This it's a most epsilon far from something that is. Exactly epsilon or epsilon squared. Uh, I'm always confused about it, uh, but basically think about it, right? So A bar is in W. So in particular, this is a point in W that is, right? So this, this is a point in W that is, uh, uh, that is epsilon close. So it happens also with the closest point, but even if it wasn't, that already upper bounds the how far this is from. So if you extract the, the rank one uh, matrix from, uh, you get something that is epsilon close to the subspace W. Does, does that make sense? So basically, again, so so I have like this, I have some arbitrary distribution d over w. I take its average, its weighted average. I get this point a bar. This is perfectly in w. Now I look at the top eigenvector of this thing. So this is uh, u v, and the, this distance is at most epsilon. Yes, yes. No, no. I don't know the rank one element in W, but this I can actually hold in my hand. Yes. So someone gave me the moments of D, uh, and, and, uh, and I want to use them to compute something uh, like a rank one vector that's close to W. And this theorem will let me do that. And uh, okay, and, and now let me s give some intuition why a theorem like that could be true. So I'm not going to give the, you the full proof, which is a little bit technical and annoying, but uh, uh, let me give you intuition why something like that could be true. So let's start with thinking about this distribution A of the random matrices. So random rank one, uh, so, uh, 
suppose this distribution uh, was kind of a random matrix. Uh, so initially, this uh, a, a bar could be kind of like a random matrix, okay? And so generally, you could you could think of this a bar that initially, uh, if we didn't reweigh anything, it would be the farthest away thing you could ever think from a rank one matrix. It would be you know a random matrix, d eigenvalues ra ranging from minus uh, square root d to plus square root d, right? So, so initially, a bar is very much not a random matrix. But now we want to reweigh uh, re it and make it rank one. So what would we do? The idea is the following. Uh, we know the magnitude is uh, O of square root D of all the eigenvalues. Now suppose we pick some vector u0. And, uh, and let me say, like if it was random matrices, I could pick any random vector u0. If in the full proof, I have to, have to be a little bit careful of how I choose it, and also kind of we'll need to kind of repeat this argument several times. But right now, let's just say that I pick an arbitrary vector u0, and I pick this polynomial. Just, you know, u0, hit it with, u with a on both sides, and raise it to the power l. So if I do that, um, how much do I boost? Like the for this average, the the value of you uh, you know the quadratic form on u zero compared to the quadratic form on some v that is orthogonal to u zero. So if v is orthogonal to u zero, what you expect is that basically uh, this quantity and uh, this quantity and 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 this quantity are kind of uh, independent. So you basically get from this quantity will behave kind of like a normal to the power l. And this will behave like a normal squared. While if you, if you look at u0 av, and after you reweigh it, you basically get expectation, the expect expected value of this is going to be normal to the power l plus 2. So the difference is basically uh, you're going to boost up the eigenvalue corresponding to u0 compared to others, and you're going to boost it by a factor that is exactly like the ratio of you know a normal to the power l plus two divided by uh, when you divide by a normal to the power l times normal squared. And now, if you do the calculation, this comes out to be exactly l. Uh, you know, you just do uh, you look in Wikipedia what are the moments of a Gaussian, and this comes out to be exactly l. So, uh, so what this means is that you know. Um, if we if we uh, the power we choose is like slightly you know slightly larger than square root d, so square root d times log d or something like that, you know asymptotically larger than square root d, then this top eigenvalue will become the one corresponding to u zero, and it will be square root d larger than the others. And now that means that you know if you square it, the its square is more than d larger than the others, and there are only d others, so so it will dominate in the square. It will dominate all the rest. And what we kind of do in uh, our full proof is basically say, you know, either this happens or something else, you know, this is what should happen generically, but sometimes maybe it doesn't happen, but then we made some kind of progress and we repeat and uh, we show some potential decreases so we cannot, we don't need to repeat these things too much. But, th but this is basically the intuition why square root D would come up to be the right value. And and, th and this proves it. And, and, and now basically what you do is we, you know, we we show that uh, we show that if someone was kind enough to give us these degree moments of a distribution over one quantity intersect subspace, then we can f do it. And now you go and stare at that proof, and you say, what do they actually use? And it turns out you can just use some things about uh, I don't know these Gaussians, etc. Th th these are all kind of things that are like holder-like type of facts. So you stare at it hard, you show that this is in fact like low degree sum of squares uh, framework. So you, uh, so that means that basically uh, you don't need anything else. You, you didn't need this favor from someone to give you these moments because you can use the sum of squares algorithm to generate fake moments and run the same, the same algorithm as be before. So you, you, you take the, you take the constructive proof of that theorem. It gives you a polynomial, you, uh, you use that on the fake moments, and it will give you a result. And that result, you can show that it actually will work. So no, so no, the you, the you, the you 
No, so basically the actual, right, so the, the actual proof, right, will not output this U0. What will happen is if, if, it w if it's really the case that, say, the distribution is not uniform, what might happen is that you try to push U0 up and suddenly a different vector could, uh, y y there could be a vector that's kind of correlated with U0. For example, uh, you know, if the distribution was uh, somehow, uh, you know, say, suppose the distribution was only over five rank one matrices. You, you pick U0 and uh, you reweigh by U0, what will happen is that you'll basically give all the weight to the one of the five that is most correlated with U0. So in general, uh, like it's also like in low bound, like uh, basically there might be some people, uh, uh, um, lambda one will be larger than U0 a, you know, bar U0, but it doesn't mean that lambda that u0 is the top one. Maybe there will be another vector that's even bigger. And that's what generally will happen, actually. And then what happens if you have like five ones that are too big, then we, uh, we have to continue, but we have kind of radically reduced the, the dimension that we are playing with. So that's why like the actual proof is a little bit more <laughs> complicated. Yeah, so, so basically this, the idea is, uh, again, like, so we, we start by assuming that someone gave us these moments, and then we say, okay, we don't really need them, and we can, uh, and, and, uh, we can generate them ourselves using the SDP. And, uh, and that basically finishes the proof. And, and another kind of application for this, this t type of ideas is in unsupervised learning. So there, you know, we get some observations from some model, say P theta, and our goal is to recover theta. And uh, so, so again, it's usually like some kind of a brute force algorithm, like a maximum likelihood or something like that. And the idea is that I, uh, and, uh, we look at the proof that maximum likelihood uh, works. Sometimes this proof is hard to SOS size, but sometimes if you look at this proof, or maybe you can find a different proof that, uh, that maximum likelihood works, that actually uh, is in the SOS framework. And if that's the case, then you can kind of transform it and say that you can actually learn, uh, the, you know, you can actually learn an uh, approximation for the ground truth using some of squares. And I'll give you an example. I think I won't go into the proof because it might just uh, force me to rush it and I don't want to rush. But so I'll just tell you what is the result. And this is not my result. It works by Hopkins Lee and Kotari Standard Story. So it's a very, very natural problem. So uh, you're given some, uh, you know, uh, some num polynomial number of samples from some distribution n uh, over n-dimensional, and your goal is to uh, output, the, you know, approximate the mean of the distribution. So that's really simple. Just output the empirical mean, mean uh, it works really well. But what if you know that 99% of the samples came from D, but, you know, 1% of them are arbitrary outlier? Uh, what if even worse, maybe only 1% of them came, came from D and 99% are outliers, and that also can happen. And, uh, and let's even focus on the simpler case, although their result also work for the stronger case. Uh, and, and, and a few outliers can really kill you. And, and uh, you know, think of it, you have like this distribution D, suppose it was even like, you know, standard Gaussian distributions kind of uh, uh, all around. And, and you can have these outliers that each outlier in itself, it's not like you put one outlier way over here and, you know, you just look at it, it's obvious that it's an outlier. You can just put, you know, a bunch of outliers in this direction. Each one of them individually doesn't, doesn't really look like it's problematic, but uh, together they'll push, you know, uh, they, they'll push away you estimate way, you know, uh, way beyond what's supposed to be. So, you know, in principle, you could, with, you know, n over epsilon squared, you should have been able to estimate the mean up to epsilon error, and now you can make the error grow with the dimension by only adding 1% outliers. So, so this is kind of a problem of robust statistics, and, and they solve it, and the they way they solve it is the following. They take a theorem by Tukey from, uh, you know, uh, the 1960s, uh, which says that in principle you can solve it, and uh, but it gives an exponential time algorithm, and basically they do they show that uh, they give may maybe a different proof of the same theorem, 
but this new proof has a sum of squares uh, algorithm uh, proof, and then um, and, th and therefore it implies sum of squares uh, a polynomial time algorithm, and uh, and that also has been generalized to learn mixture of Gaussians and all kind of nice things. Uh, and I'll skip the actual proof because then I don't really like to rush uh, things. So yeah, the, the, these kind of results have been used in all sorts of different areas in this, this general paradigm. And I think there's more hope to also use it in more uh, things, especially in uh, uh, quantum information theory. And, and, and generally, the way I view this thing is like using this sum of squares algorithm to, uh, as a different approach to algorithm design that what's the t t canonical thing that we in theoretical computer science you know, learn. So at least in, uh, if you take an you know, algorithm course based on this book, the way you view the world of algorithms is that you know there is um, all sorts of problems. For every problem, you look at it, you think hard, you come up with a bright idea, and you come up with an algorithm. And for different problems, you have a different algorithm. And what's interesting is that, like in all of these problem uh, cases, you basically we use the same algorithm. Like I said before, I don't you know the algorithm also for the quantum. I didn't invent the algorithm; just uh, changed the analysis. So it kind of raises the question, maybe, at least in some regime of interesting problem, there is really only one algorithm. And uh, so in some sense, what you should really view things is differently. Like the, the algorithm is fixed. And what you want to understand is where the problems lie in relation to the algorithm, rather than, uh, so you know, your arrow is already stuck there. And now you're just trying to understand how far is the target uh, from it. So it's kind of a different. Uh, maybe way of thinking, and yeah. So there is still questions. Uh, we only did one minus epsilon, one versus one minus epsilon. Could you do, you know, p versus p minus epsilon for arbitrary p? Uh, still huge gap from the lower bound. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes, x log squared. Right. Thank you. And um, you know. Um, so uh, and you use it in other cases, etc. So lots of open problems. And, and one last PowerPoint trick. <laughs> That's it. Yes. <laughs> 